the, uh, the, the most persuasive thing about the paper is the bit where Shankar outlines the fact that in order to arrive at a deal, you have to play four-dimensional chess. And we've been barely playing two-dimensional chess. And we need to come back to that kind of uh, intricate solution. The only thing where I would say, I, I probably would have said a little bit more, is about that this is not about reducing standards, this is not about reducing rights, it is about uh, global standards which do, do not undermine any of our social fabric and the things which we think are important to us. But there is one thing which is, is true. There is no time to try and put the Humpty Dumpty of Czechos back together again. Uh, but there is time to get a free trade uh, agreement. There is time to make sure that we leave in March next year on orderly terms which are in everyone's interest. And I think that's what we should focus on. We can come back to the Lancaster vision, which I think was the right way forward. I just want to leave on a personal note. I have spent 15 months of my life uh, negotiating with uh, someone called Michel Barnier. Uh, and what that experience taught me is that it will always be the last 48 hours, which are the most significant, but also the most brutal. Uh, I was surprised that Salzburg was quite as brutal as it was. I, it was not that I didn't think it would get that way, it was slightly earlier. I'm glad there are two women on the panel here this morning uh, because I do wonder whether the 24 men would have behaved quite the way to a British Prime Minister and the humiliation about tweeting out pictures of cakes. So what I would just say to my fellow Europeans, uh, Brexit is important. It's important for us and for you to get this right. Stop playing childish, silly boy games. We are leaving in March 29th. Uh, this is a really important step to take us there, and we have the time to get to that withdrawal agreement on the basis largely outlined here. Gisela, thank you very much. David. Well, it's a pleasure to be here in support of IEA report number 95. It's a certain Soviet connotation to that. But, uh, um, and can I start by commending what uh, Giza has just said, and I think that demonstrates quite how a matter of national interest like this completely transcends party political interest. Uh, so, uh, now, as Shankar highlighted in the report and in detail when you read it, you'll see it, uh, the global trading system is going in entirely the wrong direction. Every, all the experts agree this from the Director General of the World Trade Organization on down. And what that means is that Britain has a particularly huge role once it has left the European Union, available to it. We don't get it automatically, but available to it is a huge role. And this amplifies the effect of any free trade policy we have. It amplifies the effect in global terms and it amplifies it in British terms. Uh, and it means, therefore, the returns to uh, trading with the rest of the world is much greater than you, than you would otherwise assess. And, of course, it's traditional that people underestimate the gains from free trade. Even New Zealand, that, uh, that champion of free trade, underestimated some of its free trade arrangements, the effect of it, by 500%, 500%. And I expect us to see equally large impacts when we actually get into the free trade deals that we ought to. What this means is, as Gisela said, is we need to reset the negotiations. Uh, we're currently, bluntly, in a cul-de-sac. Um, uh, I'm afraid, uh, I slightly disagree with Gisela, I think Salzburg was unfortunately all too predictable. She may be right about timing, but I'm afraid it was all too predictable how it would turn out either here or, or in October. Now, what we need to do is to use the original commitments made back on March the 7th, I think by both Tusk and Barnier, to go for an advanced free trade agreement. And the reason that this is called Plan A+, plus is what we need is an FTA+, plus, a free trade agreement Plus. And to do that, we need, and, the, and again, the report goes into this in some detail, to do that, we need to use our allies. Uh, as Shankar said, 
uh, the rest of the world does not see uh, European negotiation as uh, a gold standard. Just the opposite. They see it as an outlier. They see it as anti-competitive. They see it as protectionist. Incidentally, one of the reasons that many big companies like uh, European negotiation is precisely because it is protectionist. There's a tremendous case study in here of the REACH, the chemical, uh, the chemical uh, uh, standards, and how that works, and really how even the Commission recognise that it's ineffective and bad. Now, I don't agree with every word of what Shank has written. It would be very surprising in 130 odd pages that uh, two different people would agree uh, the same. But I agree with 90 odd percent of it. It's probably true to say that if this had been the white paper, I'd still be in government today. Um, uh, so we need to take a model like this. We need to grasp the Brexit prize and we need to act properly for the enormous benefits that are to be had from a proper free trade policy. Thank you. David, many thanks. Jacob, can I ask you to take to the stage? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is gloriously appropriate that we are talking about free trade in the Gladstone Library because Gladstone got rid of more tariffs in his budgets than any other Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, in history. And he took over four and a half hours to do so, which you'll be glad to know I'm not going to do. Um, the great virtue of this plan is that it is deliverable. It is based on precedence and extending what is already done, and it works towards a Brexit prize. Keep that mind, phrase in your minds, because so much of what we have about these negotiations has been about managing decline, has been about how do you have the least bad Brexit. This is about how you have a fantastic Brexit that sets us up for the next generation and ensures our prosperity. So it's a really exciting uh, and good paper looking at Britain's position, not just in the European context, but globally. And the key to it, to my mind, is that it is deliverable. Bear in mind, as David says, this has been offered to us by the Commission. They have offered us the best trade deal they have done with any country ever in the world. So if you want to call it Canada Plus or Super Canada or Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious Canada, that is what is being aimed at and it's being offered as long as you can solve the Northern Ireland question, which I think the ERG did uh, a week or so ago. So you've got Northern Ireland solved, you've got a free trade deal, you've got something that is deliverable. And then the question is, will it work within the country at large? Well, we know that checkers won't. And we know that there is nervousness about leaving purely on world trade terms. So if people are focusing on what the real options are after the EU has comprehensively snubbed the Prime Minister and the country, then the real option that faces the nation is do we have a free trade deal or do we leave on world trade terms? And I think that reality, that consciousness, will ensure that if this got to the House of Commons, it would be passed. So it's not just deliverable in terms of the European Union, it's deliverable in terms of British public opinion, and it's deliverable in terms of parliamentary votes. I think this paper is therefore the most exciting contribution we have had to this debate in many months. Thank you. Jacob, thank you very much, and last but by no means least, Theresa. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm delighted to be here to commend this very impressive piece of work. Um, whilst there are one or two minor points where I diverge from the paper, the overall plan is a sensible, practical way forward to delivering the right Brexit outcome. It is a deliverable blueprint to deliver a wide-ranging free trade agreement between the European Union and the United Kingdom. It's in line with the Lancaster House speech, and as others have emphasised, it's also very much in line with the way countries around the world do business day in, day out. We're not asking for anything exceptional from the European Union. And as we all know, the Irish border has been the blockage which has caused progress towards a comprehensive free trade agreement to stall. This is the key reason behind the proposals in the Chequers plan. 
So if we can find a way to maintain the drive-through border we have on the island of Ireland, but within the context of a trade deal, we can unlock the negotiations and put them back on track to a Canada Plus type arrangement. The ERG paper last week proposed how we do just that. The approach set out in Shanker's document today has a number of similarities with the ERG plan, though it takes a different approach in certain respects, for example, on continued harmonization of rules on animals and food between Northern Ireland and the European Union. But these, IEA, these proposals should be seen as a further indication that the border question does not require the compromises of the Chequers plan, that there are ways to make the border work pretty much as it does today without the common rule book or the complex customs arrangements in the Chequers white paper. And this can be done within existing technology and with existing legal and administrative procedures. So we can legitimately seek a free trade agreement with the EU whilst maintaining a free-flowing border without harming the integrity of the single market. That's what the ERG paper set out to do, and today uh, this document is making the same point, albeit with a subtly different plan to answer that question. And I think also today's report makes the vital point that actually around the world, there's a trend towards reducing the cost of customs compliance, making it more streamlined, making it um, more based on systems rather than individual transactions. So it would be a great pity if the entire future of the United Kingdom's economic relationship with its European neighbours was to falter on the basis of customs paperwork which is becoming increasing, increasingly easy to do across borders around the world. Um, so I think a very good message to take away from today's event and from the report that it's here to launch is that it's time to put a draft free trade agreement on the table in Brussels and start some serious negotiations. Uh, Teresa, thank you very much. We do have some um, time for questions. We have a microphone coming down the aisle, so do put your hand in the air if you'd like to ask a question. I would be keen to take questions about policy rather than politics, if that's possible. I'll start with Faisal. Uh, Faisal Islam, Sky News. Um, the, the report acknowledges that under this uh, plan there will be some frictions that you have to mitigate. So whatever the prize in the future, can I just ask the panel, uh, those industries and those workers in those industries that might face immediate frictions, i.e. their jobs or their pay, do they deserve to be told about them now in advance of the deal being done? And can I ask the politicians on the panel whether they think there's anything in what the Prime Minister has said that will lead her to abandon checkers for this plan? Faisal, thank you. I'll start with Shankar and actually then just work down the panel. Thank you for that question, Shankar. Th thanks for that question. Um, so I, I don't think it's binary, and, and one of the things we say in the plan you know, a lot is that we're, we're doing two things here. We're trying to maximise the opportunities and we're trying to minimise the disruptions. It's not a binary choice. We think there are sufficient mitigants in here to take, if there are any frictions, and remember friction is on a spectrum. It's either zero or there is you know, a highly untrusted border. What we're trying to do is to take what currently exists, which is not zero, it, there are existing things, and, and, and mitigate for how that changes. And we think we are able to do that. It's not one thing, it's a series of different um, customs proposals to ensure that supply chains work. Um, and it basically, as Theresa actually said, there is a whole you know, uh, thinking in the customs world that is moving from goods trade, where you do the transactions tied to the goods moving themselves, to trader system-based transactions, so it's more like filing you know, a tax return for very, very trusted supply chains. And so we think that it's solvable. We think you can do that. But the bigger question is, if you can do that, if you can increase those frictions only a little, you know, there's a minimal amount, the, the real question is, do you then, because you can do that, keep the options, the opportunities on the table. And that's what I think is the most important thing. And I think that's what's been most missing from the, from the debate. 
Peter, I wonder if I can ask our panellists as well on Faisal. Very quick response, Faisal, because you've, you've just highlighted one of the things which has bedeviled these whole debates. You sort of talk about mitigating friction, and then as a good journalist, you want to know how many jobs does that equal. Uh, and as, as the paper explains, it's, it's, it's a kind of four-dimensional chess you're playing here on making these arrangements. And if you talk to the big companies, you know, if you even talk to your BMWs, your VWs, who, who need global supply chains, they, they just want to know what the rules are, and they will meet them. And so there will be things done differently, but I'm afraid I can't help you with a headline which says, this will be seven and a half jobs. <laughs> David. First thing to say is there are frictions now. Uh, in Northern Ireland, there's uh, an invisible border, but it's not no border. There's a VAT border, an excise border, a whole series of forms you have to fill in. Um, and if you're not a British citizen or an Irish citizen, you cross the border, you might also f find that there's a, there's a, a personnel border too. Um, if you want to talk about the uh, continental border, if you, uh, uh, if you look back through your own uh, television archives, you'll find 35 days of delays at Calais uh, because of a French strike, uh, I think in 2015. So there are frictions now. Let's not pretend they're not. Um, secondly, so the frictions are not, uh, are not lethal. They're just things to be managed. And I thought one of the interesting examples of that just recently was, I think it was BMW, one of the car firms anyway, announced that they were going to move their annual maintenance period to immediately after uh, after the uh, Brexit day. And this was held up as, oh, look, look at the damage. But they always have their annual maintenance period, and it lasts for weeks, I think. So if, it, if they can handle weeks of delay because of their maintenance, why can't they handle hours of delay because of uh, an irritating French customs official? Um, and uh, in terms of the, uh, what we say to the workforce, well, the first thing we say to the workforce is we're not going to exaggerate the cost of borders to ridiculous levels which is what's happened so far in this debate. We have seen numbers about the costs of friction at the borders, which are just unbelievable. And if you want to test that, go talk to the Swiss, who will give you numbers that are about 1% of what are being claimed by those who try to make a scare story out of this. Thank you. Jacob. Um, thank you. I'd follow on from that, uh, that <coughs> six seconds of delays in goods coming in via Southampton well, you get longer delays when there's a minor jam on the M25 for just-in-time delivery. And I think you really do have to contextualise this. But you have to accept the fact that we are leaving the European Union and therefore it will be different. And to try and pretend it'll be the same once we've left is cloud cuckoo land. That's not what people voted for. Uh, on your question of with the prime, will the Prime Minister accept this, well, I think the Prime Minister is a lady of singular wisdom and therefore is likely to recognise the reality that Chequers doesn't have much support, either in this country or abroad, and that this plan solves all her problems. And with her wisdom and insight, I'm sure she will be thinking very carefully about adopting it. Theresa. I think it is these negotiations fully informed about the consequences in terms of our economy, but what today is about is demonstrating that actually the consequences for our economy can be incredibly positive if we seize this opportunity um, to agree a free trade agreement. And it is important to put in context you know, the, the source of the dispute, i.e. the formalities and the frictions that come with a customs barrier. And I think you know, the detail of this paper puts forward some credible and practical and convincing um, solutions to ensure that we reduce um, and minimise that friction within the context of, as Jacob points out, a different relationship between the UK and the rest of the European Union than has been the case in the past. Thank you. Let me come back to the floor. Gary, if you can just wait till the microphone gets to you, Gary. Thank you very much, Gary Gibbon, Channel 4 News. Uh, two, on, two on the document, if I may. Um, some people are saying you can't possibly expect India or another major economy to get involved in serious trade negotiations until they know what our relationship is with the EU. You're saying plough ahead now. What's, what's the answer to that? It also looks in the document as though you're saying uh, when it comes to food regulation and areas like labour and environment law, we should move a bit towards America and away from Europe. A lot of people would be very fearful of that. Why shouldn't they be? And may I ask one to the politicians on the panel, which is uh, you're saying that Theresa May had this plan in her back pocket. It was the implication of Lancaster House. Do you really believe that? Or do you think Lancaster House was a 
bit of a decoy put there to keep you on the journey. Uh. Shankar, perhaps I can ask you to deal with the two questions about the document, and then I'll ask about Shankar's house speech and its, uh, its depth to the panel. Yes, um, thank you, Gary. Um, with respect to agreements with other countries, and, and whether it's the US or India or, or any of the countries that we suggested or CPTPP accession, um, these are things that we need to be progressing now. Um, every country that's involved in a trade negotiation knows that it's negotiating with people who are also negotiating other things with other people. They, they do know this, and it is part of the negotiating dynamics. What I think we mustn't do, and what I think the key recommendation that we've made here, is that what we mustn't do is say all of our trade policy for the whole world is going to be judged through this EU-UK lens. Because if we do that, then we'll end up on the uh, EU battlefield, and we will end up with an agreement that will preclude all the benefits that we could have in other areas, which is not necessary, because we can concurrently negotiate, lots of countries concurrently negotiate deals with lots of people. Uh, Mexico, for example, had negotiated literally tens of trade agreements, I mean, 30 or 40. Um, it, it, it is cap you're capable of doing this. And there's a huge advantage to doing it, because actually, as we've said, these various, the pillars of our trade policy that I've, that I've suggested, uh, the unilateral, bilateral, plurilateral, multilateral pillars, um, they, they can mutually reinforce each other. They can help you get a better deal with the EU. If the EU sees that we are negotiating seriously with the US and with uh, CPTPP and others, if they see that, they, will, they may not like it, they may shout and scream about it, but they will react differently to you. If they think that you are the only... If they, they think that you think that they're the only game in town, then they will make hay with you. And I think that is what is happening, and that's a problem. Um, with respect to this question about regulation, um, we are not suggesting, and we never have suggested, sort of massive deregulation. That's not what we're suggesting here. What we're suggesting is better regulation. What we're suggesting is what is the global norm? The global norm, based on the WTO and the OECD and other uh, organizations, is that you want to regulate in ways that are the least trade restrictive, the least anti-competitive, consistent with a legitimate regulatory goal. That's the goal of your regulatory process, and that's what everyone broadly in the world has, has agreed. Um, where I think the EU has diverged from that, then absolutely yes, I think we want to take a different approach. Because actually when you regulate in ways that are anti-competitive or trade restrictive, you destroy wealth out of the economy. And I think that's happened in, uh, in the EU28 uh, over the last few years. And I think we do want to see the advantages of moving away from that. But we can do that and still have a framework of regulatory recognition with the EU. There's regulatory recognition all over the world. The EU and uh, New Zealand have ag agreed regulatory recognition for meat products trade. You know, so, so very, very sensitive subject. New Zealand and the EU have recognized underlying product regulation even though those product regulations differ. So it is capable of happening. They can do it. Um, and, and that's what I would uh, recommend. Should I take the political question? Please do, David. Uh, well, well, on, on regulation, the issue is who decides. And the issue of regulation will be who decides. And the checkers, it's the European Union that decides. And the free trade plus, it's us that decides. And we will decide, because of what we've already said in our discussions with them, to try and get the same outcomes, or similar outcomes, equally high health, equally high safety, equally high quality, but in a pro-competitive way, not a protectionist way. So that's the distinction. Now, as for Lancaster House, uh, uh, Jacob quite rightly said the Prime Minister is a wise lady. She's also a lady of very great integrity. Uh, and Lancaster House was met, as was Mansion House, and I can say that with absolute certainty because I helped write them. Thanks very much. Let me come back. I know there was lots of other uh, questions. Let me take um, Henry here. Thank you. Henry Mance from the Financial Times. Um, uh, Mr. Rees-Mogg, you say that the question is whether the country will wear this plan better than it's prepared to wear the Chequers proposal. Is the obvious uh, solution to that not to offer it to the country in a referendum alongside Mrs. May's plan? I'll take that straight. The question on the second referendum, the support a discussion paper number 95. <laughs> I think, Mark, you've answered the question, answered the question better than I could. Uh, the, the truth is, the people who are campaigning for a second referendum want to stop us leaving the European Union. That's what the campaign is about. It's nothing to do with getting the people to decide. 
Deciding the forms of a trade agreement is the routine matter of a parliamentary democracy for Parliament. Changing your fundamental constitutional arrangements is an appropriate matter for a referendum. We've had that referendum. But even more, we had that referendum based on a manifesto commitment from David Cameron in 2015. And we had it affirmed by the 2017 general election when both parties, major parties, said that they would implement the result of the referendum. So we've had three national votes on leaving the European Union. And I'm afraid the Remainers who want another referendum hold democracy in contempt. They lost, and they should grow up. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's Chris Morris from BBC. Um, uh, Shankar, I note your report says um, that you admit many of the things in it are minority opinions. You say, beware the economic consensus, the IMF, the OECD, the government's own analysis. And that applies in, in many ways, I think, to your um, solutions in Northern Ireland as well, and on the Irish border. I'm, I'm genuinely interested in why, why do you think all these other economists and experts have got it so wrong and you've got it so right? Um, and for the politicians on the panel, um, how much friction, how much extra friction in trade with Europe is acceptable? And Jacob, you mentioned six seconds at Southampton, but as you all know, uh, much of the trade between the EU and the UK is uh, food and animal stuff which comes in every day. Um, EU rules on that are extremely strict. I think it's 100% of document checks and about 50% of physical checks. That's going to be more than six seconds. So. I think one of the things that obviously a lot of business up and down the country would like to know from this is how much more delay is acceptable in your opinion because they're the ones that are going to have to deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. Shankar, can I start with you and then run down the panel? Shankar. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just on economic analysis, uh, first of all, it is not just um, us that believe that there is a, uh, a benefit to uh, if the UK is able to adopt an independent trade and regulatory policy and therefore reduce barriers around the world, that that will give a significant economic gain. The OECD has said this. The OECD has said that uh, for developed countries, uh, reduction of uh, regulatory reform, reduction of regulatory barriers can amount to 5 to 7 percent of GDP, which is an order of magnitude bigger than what well, it's much larger than the border barrier uh, reductions. So border barrier reductions might give you about a 2% increase in GDP. Um, behind the border barriers, distortions are much, much bigger. And the point, of course, is that they're increasing. As Azevedo has said, that the, these, these distortions and global regulatory protections have been massively on the increase since the financial crisis. So you're, you're, you're sort of looking at a very, very large amount of uh, trade barriers and regulatory distortions that you can do something about with your independent policy. If, if in fact that wasn't the case, if the world was going fantastically well and the trading system was doing fantastically well, then clearly that, that gain would be much, much less. And that's what we say in the, in the, in the paper. Um, I, I would say that there have been all sorts of economic analyses done about things like the euro, done about things like the ERM, done about all kinds of different um, policy decisions that a, a country could make that have been frequently wrong. The point that we're trying to make is it's very, very hard to model this. And David gave the example of New Zealand and the underestimate. The New Zealand report on, on the, its uh, trade agreement with China underestimated not only by 500%. What they said is they, New Zealand would reach a level of exports in 20 years that they actually reached in 20 months. So economic analysis is frequently wrong. It, it's based on your fundamental assumptions. The problem is the assumptions have been that we won't be able to do any of the things suggested in this, in this plan. And clearly, if we can't do any of the things suggested in this plan, then the numbers are going to be very, very different. With respect to the Irish border, really quickly, We've proposed a lot of technical solutions. We've proposed moving people to trusted trader. We've proposed um, being more exemptions for small businesses. We've proposed, proposed WTO waivers, all kinds of things. Frankly, I, 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 don't, I could propose 500 things that could solve the, um, the Irish border. It is not a technical problem. It is a diplomatic problem. And one of the things that we have suggested is what we actually need to do is to have pragmatic people on both sides of the border who are willing to listen to technical solutions and give them a fair hearing. And if that happened, I think we could solve this problem um, much, much more readily. Thank you. Gisela and the politicians on the panel, the sort of question of how much friction is too much friction, I suppose. Theresa. No, I think Theresa maybe Theresa. Um, 
the key challenge is to minimise friction, whether it's Dover or whether it's um, in relation to our land border. And today's paper has you know, clear proposals for doing that. And you have, you know, it, it's, not, it's not just the IEA saying, saying this. You have both the head of HMRC and the head of uh, the Revenue Inn, the Republic of Ireland, saying they, they don't need physical infrastructure at the border. Um, you see a trend throughout the world to, you know, essentially adopt a similar approach to customs declaration as, as companies already do regularly with VAT returns. There are all sorts of ways in which, with political will, we can ensure that our borders function effectively uh, just as well after Brexit as they do now. And I think we also need to remember that the European Union is subject to legal obligations it undertakes as a member of the World Trade Organization, and those include um, the land, you know, groundbreaking customs facilitation treaty agreed by the WTO and endorsed by the European Union only relatively recently. Um, and then there's Article 8 of the Lisbon Treaty, which obliges the European Union to maintain cooperative relationships with its neighbours. Um, you know, some of the scare stories about, um, you know, go slow at the border and blockage in Calais, they would actually be unlawful in terms of the European Union's obligations on the international stage. With political will, we can resolve these questions to keep trade flowing between us and the European Union. It's in both sides of the no negotiation that we exercise that political will and deliver a free trade agreement between us. Carl. Thank you. Uh, Carl Dinan from ITV News. Um, you may have some good ideas here about how to keep trade flowing across the Irish border. Uh, the Prime Minister has ideas about that too. But the European Union, until those ideas can be shown to work, still wants a backstop in the withdrawal agreement in case those ideas don't work. How does any of this get you over that difficulty about the Irish backstop? Uh, and if I may, one about a broader Brexit policy for the politicians on the panel. It has been suggested that the Home Secretary wants to keep the door open to EU migrants for two years after Brexit. I wonder what you think about that. Does it make any difference? Shankar, perhaps you can take the backstop question. Yeah. Well, first of all, what I'd say about the backstop is you, know, you can get the backstop right on the That's deliberate because one of the things that we want to stress is that the, it's the negotiating strategy uh, ha, has, has not worked here. And, and, and we're not going to try to solve the issue of the moment with this plan. This is a comprehensive plan. You have to do all of it. You can't take bits and pieces of it. So that's the first thing I would say. On the backstop, we do, we do present proposals on what the backstop should be. But I would also point out that we have moved from sufficient progress being made on the Irish border in order to get to a negotiation of the future framework for the trade relationship, which is what it was originally about, to the need for a comprehensive backstop, to uh, a backstop that would not have a hard border at all in, uh, in the whole uh, of the island of Ireland, as opposed to the language that I think makes the most sense, which is not hardening the Irish border consistent with the Good Friday Agreement, the peace process, and the all-Ireland economy, which is what I think you know, we should be aiming for. That being said, I think the only backstop that actually works, and the one that we've proposed here, and people may disagree with it, is, um, is, is, is you've got to have a free trade agreement in goods. You've got to have zero tariffs in order for the backstop to work. That's got to be done between the UK and the EU. And the advantage of this, it, it, it finally takes back uh, the leverage on this issue, and, and it... it even Tusk, they have all proposed a free trade agreement with the UK. So the notion that the backstop would be an FTA between the UK and the EU, basic FTA, goods, tariffs going to zero, and the mitigations that we have suggested here, uh, I think is an eminently sensible backstop, and we would commend it to both the Irish, uh, the European Commission, and the UK uh, government. So we've, we have laid that out here, and I think it's, again, I think it's a diplomatic issue. Uh, the, the concern I have about the way the Irish issue has played out is it's very, very dangerous. If there is, in fact, a technical and diplomatic solution to this problem, and what the Irish government have done, particularly by hanging on to this particular issue, is you'll get, if this results in no free trade agreement at all between the UK and the EU, then the British government is going to be faced with a choice. They're going to be faced with a choice, which is either we're going to have food price inflation because we've got you know, tariffs 
on agricultural products, or we're going to have to lower unilaterally our agri-food tariffs, which is going to cause mass, and that would have to be on an MFN basis, and that would cause massive damage to the Irish beef industry. So this is a very dangerous situation. I think there are pragmatic and uh, technical solutions to this. I think we should advance them before we have a, a problem of our own making. Can I just ask any of the politicians who want to come in on the immigration question, yeah. the present thinking as of the Home Secretary? Gisela. As an immigrant and a grandmother, <laughs> I'll take the immigration one. Uh, I, I think that the, the newspaper story about the Home Secretary, I'm not entirely sure to what extent that's really news, because th those kind of rights would have been already entailed in the, immigration, in, in the implementation period. But can I just say something much more significant about this? First of all, this country now needs to have a proper discussion of what we think the purpose of our immigration policy is. And from that, it will flow what it will be. And we have done uh, uh, focus groups with Change Britain, both with people who voted leave and those who voted remain. And it's quite amazing how, how short a period it takes for both groups to say a, a, a merit-based point system uh, which is actually equal treatment for everyone, uh, is the best way forward. And the, the, the second one is we should not underestimate a significant achievement in the United Kingdom in the wake of the referendum. All across Europe, minor parties who focus on immigration for all the wrong reasons have attracted enormous support from the voters. In some countries, they're holding their governments to, to, to ransom. What we've achieved in the United Kingdom is a debate on immigration will be conducted by the two major parties and the two major front benches in hope in a rational and sensible way. And that is how it should be done. Bianca. Thank you. Bianca Nobolo, CNN. Could you elaborate on um, what it is specifically in the Prime Minister's white paper that would prohibit independent free trade deals with other countries and participating in plurilateral partnerships from your analysis and any discussions with officials from other potential trading partners? Shankar, I think that's really one for you. You mentioned that you, it took off the table, but I'll, if any of our panelists want to come in on that as well, just catch my eye. Yeah, yeah. So essentially, what, what, and we have a chapter in the paper that I'd refer you to that sort of discusses this in great detail. The, the issue is, um, and uh, without going into a long speech about it, um, the harmonization to the EU rule book by treaty in goods and agri food, even though it's for the trade uh, arrangements. Um, means that you cannot negotiate on those things with another party. So if, if, if you want services concessions, for example, from the US or from any other party, and you say to them that you can't, you want those things yourself, but you can't give them what they want on goods and agriculture, for example, which we would not be able to do, um, you know, they'll tell you to go and pound sand. I mean, they, 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 they'll, they'll not, that negotiation won't go very far. Uh, and that is exactly what the U.S. has done. I mean, the interesting thing with the U.S. is that the key things they want are in goods and agriculture. And, um, yes, they're willing to have nice conversations with us, but unless we can do those things, there won't be any serious, serious deal. And that's what they reinforced in my trip over there last week. In the report, we cite to three different two former GATT Council chairs and um, a former deputy USTR um, from Australia, New Zealand, and the US, who all said, this takes your independent trade policy off the table. It, 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 there's a confusion here, I think, sometimes, in what you can legally do and what you can practically do. Uh, you may have the legal right to negotiate a trade deal, but if no one wants to negotiate with you, it's not a very useful right. So that's the, the issue. The CPTPP has a very specific set of regulatory uh, measures in its regulatory coherence chapter. And if you don't control your rule book, um, then you're not going to be able to negotiate with them. Um, and frankly, every country that we'd want to negotiate with, because of the nature of our, of our economy, is going to want the same things, and they're all precluded by, by checkers. Now, there is a way that I think you can take some of the things some of the ideas in checkers, the, the uh, ideas in checkers on services, on mutual recognition of occupations, these things are reasonable things on which you can build a, a construct an agreement. Um, but, you know, the notion of a common rule book, if it was genuinely a common rule book arrived at by both the UK and the EU in the form of an advanced trade agreement or free trade plus, as David calls it, um, that's perfectly fine. You know, that, that, that's, that, that's not a problem. The problem is, what is your scope of authority to act? And if you don't have it, which the Czechos certainly 
uh, doesn't have it, um, then, then, then you may as well uh, stay in the customs union in the single market. Uh, let me take another question. I will, I will come to the panel uh, again, right at the, uh, yeah, just at the back here. Yep. Uh, Jack Doerr from the Daily Mail. Jack, can I just pick you up on the point you made earlier? In fact, you just referred to it about what the US is saying about the prospect of a trade deal under checkers. Who exactly was it you, you were talking to on the US side who, who said that the deal was impossible? Yeah, I, I'm not going to reveal names of, 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 of USTR officials, but um, what I will refer you to is the very detailed statement of the former US ambassador to the WTO and uh, um, former deputy USTR Peter Algar, who is very clear in his assessment of, uh, of what Chequers does for your trade policy. And I'd also refer you to the statements of Alan Oxley, who's the former Australian ambassador to uh, the WTO former GATT Council chairman and founder of the Cairns Group. Um, he's, he said some very specific things also about um, why this takes your trade policy off the table. Okay, let me, one, one final question, yes. You can wait till the microphone gets to you. Uh, Matt Dathan from The Sun. Um, to the uh, Tory politicians on the panel, are you going to set a deadline for um, uh, to accept this plan? If she doesn't, what will you do then? Okay, well, that's certainly not one for Shanker. <laughs> no. Uh, I think that would be almost as discourteous as the European Union, so I wouldn't dream of doing such a thing. And uh, Theresa, you... Is our, is our expert on courtesy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've probably got time for one more. So, so succinct were our politicians. Uh, let me take John May at the front here. Just wait till the microphone gets to you, John. politician and I'm not a journalist, I'm a businessman. And I do think it's absolutely essential that the business view is heard in this debate. Um, I campaigned on behalf of Business for Britain in the east of England and I think this plan represents a route map to the Brexit prize that you referred to because what business is crying out for, irrespective of what their view is on the referendum, is certainty. And on the topic of friction, which seems to have crept in as a euphemism, all British businesses deal with friction. It's what you do. And they're very successful at doing it. It's one of the reasons why our trade with the rest of the world is increasing. It's also one of the reasons why our trade with Europe is declining, because the regulations that British businesses have to go through um, are holding them back. My question is a very simple one on timing. And there's both a trade policy and there's a political question to it. We're at the final stages of Brexit. What is the time scale on which it's possible to implement a trade deal and how quickly would it take to get the political will to do it? Thank you. Thank you very much. Shankar, let me start with you and then go down the panel with any other closing thoughts that you, Shankar, or the rest of our panellists wish to give, but uh, particularly on timetable and the voice of business. John yeah. is interested. Um, I, I think on the voice of business, um, you know, we've heard a lot from managers of the UK-EU supply chain. And managers of the EU-UK EU, supply chain will always tell you that what they want is no change. I mean, that's obviously what they're going to tell you. We think there are other businesses, though. I mean, bi business is not only those people. It's also businesses of the future. It's entrepreneurs. It's um, global businesses. It's a, a whole range of people who we don't tend to hear very much from. Um, and I think the role of business in this is to ask yourself, um, what do you want the world to look like? You know, what kind of regulatory system, trading environment do you actually want for the world? And then to tell the managers of the UK-EU supply chain how they use this big event, which is the UK uh, adopting an independent trade and regulatory policy for the first time, how do you use that to uh, achieve your goals? So if you want, you know, better IP protection, if you want uh, less anti-competitive regulation, whatever it happens to be, how do you use that? I think the problem is that a lot of the big global businesses... Uh, now are basically just asking their UK EU supply chains what do they want and obviously they're getting the answer no change well that's not good for shareholders that's not I would argue that's not the chief executive doing his job but um, but I, again, I think there are all these huge potential gains now on the timing question um, it's, it's very interesting this this question because time is a dimension of a negotiation which we have not used at all and which the Europeans know how to use in only one way which is to run the clock out so your back is against the wall. We have to learn how to use time in the negotiation. 
Uh, it is amazing to me in any trade negotiation, or frankly any negotiation, how time expands the closer you get to the deadline. So much can be achieved in the final you know, 36, 48 hours. It's extraordinary how, how much can actually be achieved when people really have you know, their back against the wall. The way we use time to our advantage is by doing the things that we can do that we have control over unilaterally and also with other trading partners who are predisposed toward, towards us or who have goodwill towards us. Um, do as much of those things as you can so you're setting up the chessboard and then you'll find that the EU will have a very different approach to your uh, proposals and your ideas. Please look. I will defer to domestic timings to the three people who still have a vote on all this, which um, I'm afraid I no longer have, and just add uh, the di dimension from the European Union side. Um, we are leaving, and they, the reason why I think we need to start using time, because they are also up against time, is the European elections next year. You've got to remember uh, that if you look at the composition of national governments across Europe, that will be a pretty Eurosceptic Euro European Parliament they're going to be faced with. I mean, just what kind of MEPs do you think Hungary, Poland, Sweden, Italy, Vietnam, Austria is going to return? You also have got a new commission. And I think it is in a much in their interest to actually do those deals with that current set of people, within the current set of the politics, as it is in ours. And I think we need to, to use that tension just a little bit more. David. The gentleman uh, who spoke uh, made a very good point that the friction that businesses face is not just at the border, it's all the regulatory friction that uh, exists in their marketplace. And the clumsy and often protectionist uh, uh, regulation that the European Union generates is an order of magnitude greater than any friction at the border could ever be. And in the report, there's a very good example talking about reach and the various people's opinions of it. That's the chemical uh, regulation. And I'll reiterate um, Shankar's point that uh, big corporations' primary interest is keeping things as stable as possible in the next few years. They're not taking a very long-term view on this. And, of course, nobody represents the companies that don't exist yet. The real threat of checkers is to the new businesses, the AI businesses, the genetics businesses, the other high-tech businesses, where we're going to be world leaders but we're not even going to be deciders over our own regulations. Uh, that's going to be done by the European Union, normally against their interests. Timing, it's not just the last 48 hours, it's sometimes the last 48 minutes or the last 48 seconds uh, in negotiation when the pressure really comes to bear. And this is the point, it's the interplay between time and pressure. And what's going to happen in the next few months, because really there's an effective hard uh, deadline before Christmas sometime, just because of the need to ratify and the need to uh, put in place legislation, uh, the pressure on all sides is going to go up. And people forget, you know, if we end up with a tariff-based uh, World Trade uh, Organization outcome, German car sales in this country will drop by probably a third, something like that. Uh, German dairy sales in this country drop by two-thirds. Uh, and you can do the same numbers for Belgium, the Netherlands, Ireland you've heard about, uh, French winemakers, and so on. So the pressure will be on both sides. So the point under those circumstances, the tactical point under those circumstances, is to have your plans as well advanced and as um, concrete as possible, right down to the legal text. It's very good that there's a, there's a draft uh, example chapter at the end of this book, but the, the government as well, my last instruction virtually to my department, was draft the legal text for the Free Trade Plus arrangement, so that you've got it to work from. If you've got that to work from, the time-spinning, time-wasting activities of the European Commission, which we've seen lots of in the last two years, fail in the face of the need of the, work of the 27 to have a deal and to be able to recognise a deal which is in their interest. Jacob. I just add to that, it's Parkinson's law that work expands to fill the time available, but it also shrinks to fill the time available. And they will suddenly discover, as David's been saying, that they need to do things quickly and they need to get a move on. And that's what the European Union does. Just remember that the uh, Greek bailout was agreed over a weekend, regardless of all the EU regulations that said it was completely impossible. They sorted out the uh, legal niceties uh, and the cost to the German taxpayer uh, somewhat later. Uh, and I'd also refer you to, on the um, regulatory bit to pages 25 to 29 of the report. It goes through a number of regulations 
um, REACH, MIFID, Solvency II. And the key to remember about all those regulations is that they help incumbents and they make it difficult for competitors. Now, I ought to like them because I'm still the chairman of Somerset Capital Management. And as an established company, MIFID II is fantastic because we can afford to take on a new compliance officer and deal with all this. When I set up my business in 2007, if all these regulations had then been in place, which had no protection to customers of any kind whatsoever, it would simply have made it harder to do, if not impossible. So as a fat incumbent, I'm quite happy. But if I were a thin and hungry entrepreneur, I'd be very dissatisfied, and I think we should support the thin and hungry entrepreneurs. Theresa. I agree that a key part of the Brexit prize is taking back control of the way we regulate our economy. Um, we will all, there's cross-party consensus that we will want to maintain our high standards in relation to employment protection, the environment, you know, consumer protection. The key gain is to be able to decide how we deliver those outcomes. As someone who spent six years in the European Parliament, I can attest personally that the regulation making in Europe is distinctly suboptimal. And it's, there's a huge potential for growth and prosperity if we regain control of how to ensure that we continue to deliver those, those vital outcomes, but we do it in a way which is better suited to our own domestic circumstances, which is more efficient, which is less costly, and which promotes rather than inhibits competition. And I'd just like to close by saying countries around the world do their trading arrangements on the basis of free trade agreements of the sort that are advocated by the IEA document today. We're not asking for the world, we're not asking for anything abnormal. We are asking the European Union to treat us in a broadly similar way they do many other of their trading partners. You know, this document demonstrates, it's a further illustration, that we can make a free trade agreement work, including in relation to the border on the island and Ireland, and now it's time to table a text, put it on the table, and get to work. <laughs>